Yet another shooting massacre of 17 students in Parkland, Florida, has brought the issue of corporate lobbying back into public consciousness, with outrage over the National Rifle Association's power and influence over politicians. According to Open Secrets, in 2017, the total amount spent on lobbying Congress was $3 billion, with 11,444 registered lobbyists on the Hill. That's 26 lobbyists for every elected representative. The top spender was Big Pharma at nearly $300 million, followed by industries such as oil and gas, telecommunications, weapons and war, and big banks. Experts suggest that the real amount spent on lobbying is really three times higher than being disclosed, and the true amount of lobbyists, closer to 100,000. The reforms that most Americans believe help combat the system of pay-to-play politics have instead been weaponized against them. Congressional researcher James D'Angelo has a theory based on years of mining through data that the Legislative Reorganization Act of 1970, which opened up politicians' voting records, has only helped special interests and corporations, not the people. I sat down with James to talk about how corporate lobbyists exploit transparency laws, which are thought to make the U.S. system more democratic. So before we get into how transparency has been weaponized, let's talk about how things used to be before 1970. Let's talk about how the president voted, how Congress functioned. Right, so it's actually a very interesting time. I mean, most people look back at the early 70s as a time of turmoil, there's Vietnam, there's lots of civil rights questions, but mathematically there's some very interesting things. We are talking the least partisan Congress in American history. We are talking the lowest levels of income inequality in American history. So the rich and the poor are closer than at any time in U.S. history and some of the lowest in world history. Mm. Campaign finance is zero or next to zero. Certainly if we're talking Congress, presidents always had some campaign finance issues going back to the Roosevelt's, etc. But for a member of Congress, they're not receiving money to run for Congress in 1970. Throughout history, there have been about 200 floor votes a year. So if you saw the Lincoln movie, that's actually the entire movie is about a floor vote, which is the final vote. And that vote has always been public. All the committees, however, and all the discussions and in the hearings, all of those votes, so John F. Kennedy, when he was a senator, all those votes were secret. We don't have any record of Kennedy voting in committee. And those votes are upwards of thousands per year. And that's when all the most sensitive work gets done. So there, there's very few political scholars that would reject the idea that committees are where the work is, gets done. That's where everything gets done. And then the floor vote is considered, as said by many, the show vote. So you basically already know how you're gonna vote. So if you're talking about eliminating special interests, if you're talking about taking on a corporation or et cetera, you're gonna do that in committee where the votes have always been secret, dating straight back to the Constitution, the writing of the Constitution, and even before. And in 1970, there was something called the Legislative Reorganization Act that fundamentally changed the way Congress functioned and our entire government. Talk about what that was and what it did. Right, so it's important to realize there's only two legislative reorganization acts in history. There's one in 1946, which scholars have written endlessly on, and then there's one in 1970. And think about the name of that. Legislative means law or lawmaking. Reorganization is we're gonna change it. Act means it's no longer a bill, it was passed in a law. So we are going to change how Congress works. Now notably again, this is a very important time to change Congress because we're talking about a time when inequality's been dropping for years, uh, incarceration rates have been dropping, and there's no campaign finance spending. And then we change it, and we have this explosion of, of, of changes with how Congress is responding to corporate power, et cetera. The law states a number of things, the most important of which is it says all committees must publish their votes. If you're a lobbyist in 1969, we know exactly where you are. You're in the lobby. Your name fits who you are. If you're a lobbyist after this act, especially by 73 and 75 when they underline this act, you're sitting in the committee. Now they've opened up these tables 
and you've got all the lobbyists and all the journalists here, and you're lucky if you've got a couple of constituents in these rooms. So if you're talking about Armed Service Committee, Ways and Means Committees, these are all $1,000 per hour lobbyists sitting there as they're now facing them. It seems like such an honorable initiative. Let, let's open up Congress. Let's make all the votes public. Let's finally hold these people accountable. Obviously, we know where it went, but what entities were even pushing for this to happen? And was it kind of, did it have good intentions initially? Right. So it's always hard to know what's in the hearts of men and who was pushing for it behind the scenes. And the thing, these, these acts passed overwhelmingly, so 192 to 6. Um, but we do know certain organizations pushed heavily for this. Um, one is the uh, AFL-CIO was involved. They were, they were excited. They were a very liberal group, and most of the groups that were outwardly pushing for transparency were very liberal, pushing for more civil rights laws or, or more union protections, etc. And they wanted to make sure that the legislation they were pushing for was passing. The main person pushing for this is a guy named Richard Conlin. Um, Richard Conlin was also a lobbyist, um, but he knew almost all the congressmen. He was called the 436th member of Congress by a lot of people. And so he would meet him in the uh, elevators and he would talk to them all about the provisions he was trying to pass. And they would say, oh, we're definitely supporting you. We're definitely supporting you. They'd walk into the committee. Then the bill would fail. Mm -hmm. And he'd go, but I counted you know, 60% of my, you know, the votes were going to come my way. But the votes were flipping on him inside of committee, and so he was very furious about this. And that's exactly what he wanted to do. He wanted to pressure from the outside, as a lobbyist, the way members vote. So these are the two main groups. We don't have civic groups running around with banners, we want more transparency. And certainly at the time, if you look up in what Google, whatever it is that measures word usage, transparency is barely even used, accountability is barely even used. Those things have risen um, in, in the 70s and 80s. And some people have suggested uh, they've been initiatives pushed by corporations that were kicked outside of committees. Um, and so these groups that weren't making it in committees were some of the initial transparency proponents. And so many horrifying trends have taken place since 1970, James, oh, yeah. that you outlined. I mean, just, just go over some of them. Taxes on the wealthy up until uh, 1976, the marginal tax rate, so there's effective tax rates, so not statutory tax rates, but what the rich are actually paying are around 74%. So the wealthy are paying 74%, and it's been high for many years. It certainly went up with World War II. As soon as they open the Ways and Means Conference Committees and the Finance Committees, which are the committees where the Senate and the House resolve their differences, they open those at the end of 75. As soon as they open in 76, the taxes on the wealthy plummet. Boom. In three years, it goes down 50%, and it's been flat ever since. And so this is what we see, right? As soon as particular committees get open, the legislation immediately benefits whatever special interests. As we know, the U.S. government was actually the, on the forefront of environmental legislation. So in the 60s and right up into 71, we were passing very strong environmental bills. People don't like to hear that Nixon is who created the EPA. <laughs> right, right, exactly. And Congress is very much in support of this, and we are just doing just the most foundational work on the environment. And we were pissing off corporations. They were just furious at this. And then we start to soften. As soon as those doors are open, corporations, oil companies, coal companies, who knows what, automotive companies, are coming into these committees and all the legislation is softening. And this is, you know, income inequality skyrocketing, the amount of lobbyists skyrocketing, the amount of money that lobbyists are putting in the system. I mean, it just, the list goes on and on and on. The vast majority of Americans support Medicare for all or some sort of federally funded mm -hmm. health care system. The vast majority of Americans support net neutrality. The vast majority of Americans oppose cutting Social Security up to 90 percent. I mean, the list goes on with that. And these are obviously big examples, right? Um, yet we see our politicians doing the opposite of every single thing that the will of the people put forward. And there's actually a study that proves this, that shows that in every example of the people's will, it doesn't matter um, 
because it's not up to the people, James. Can you talk about what this study is and, and mm -hmm. what it shows? So you've got Martin Gillen's Benjamin Page come out in 2014. They get, you know, it's, a, it's a, an elaborate and beautiful study. They gathered tons of data. I think going back to the 50s, they haven't released their work on the older data. But the recent data shows that if the vast majority of Americans support a policy proposal, um, or if the vast majority of Americans dislike a policy proposal, that policy proposal has the exact same chance of passing. So what it says is if Americans really like it or if they really hate it, it's still got about a 30% chance of passing. And the opposite is true if we look at elites or special interests. So if elites or special interests really hate a policy proposal, it's really unlikely that proposal is going to pass. And if they really like it, it gets up to about 60% that it's going to pass. So what it's basically saying is it's easier to kill legislation than it is to pass it, but it's also saying that elites have much more, they find much more response to their policy suggestions or policy preferences than the vast majority of Americans. Interestingly though, this is something that I looked at a while ago and presented in my research. I would say that Gillens and Page is data probably doesn't change over time. So I don't suspect that this is something that changes in 1970. I suspect that um, we're going to see those numbers be pretty flat right through the 50s. Um, and if we're talking about a policy proposal that Americans are knowledgeable of, those are actually the policy proposals that lobbyists don't do a lot of work on. It's as soon as they, and believe me, they're polling as well. So lobbyists are very aware when citizens don't know about a tax reform piece or something that's going to change taxation. As soon as it's not in the public site, that's where you're going to see the most lobbyists on. And there's been congressmen who have said this. So the least amount of public attention, the more lobbyists you get. All right? And we're talking the American public's only going to know about four or five policy changes per year. And so when we're doing thousands upon thousands, the lobbyists are going to attack all of those. And we've had the tax reform in 86, and we just had the recent one in, was it 2017? In between those two, there's been over 20,000 changes to our tax code. None of that gets covered in the newspaper. None of that's going to make the big press. But the lobbyists are there on all of those. And the pressures that politicians feel are going to be on all of those, but only from the wealthy or, or the big groups that have a lot of power. And that makes perfect sense why these numbers have remained static, because it's not saying how it changed with transparency or the weaponization of transparency. This is just saying this is the system that we have. We don't live in a democracy. We live in an oligarchy. Here's the data that proves this. So what the Transparency Initiative has done is just simply like, weaponize that system. I mean, it's made us think that we are free I think what it says more than anything is that Americans mostly don't know most of the policies. Mm -hmm. And even when they know something, I don't think they're very familiar with the ins and, out, and ins and outs of it. So if you talk about the Dodd-Frank, you know, go talk to people about the Dodd-Frank legislation on the street, and they're going to be like, oh yeah, they did something to the banks, right? I'm for it. And they're not going to know anything about the thousands of lines in there. The elites who are going to be affected by Dodd-Frank, of course, are going to know a lot more about it. And so we'd love to think that the American public is following legislation and they're understanding legislation. We just don't see that at all. We'd love to think that lobbyists aren't following legislation and they aren't the ones benefiting transparency, but that's precisely what we see. With the initiation of transparency has made people more placated into thinking that they have more power Correct. over time. Correct, absolutely. So, with 200 floor votes a year, we don't find any citizens following the 200 floor votes. So already back in the 60s, they were talking about how little people followed votes. So even congressional scholars will tell you they don't follow 200 votes a year. They don't even follow 40 votes a year. Likely you don't follow 40 votes a year. I've never met anyone who follows 40 votes a year. They increased that number in 1972, thousands of votes per year. You're talking millions and millions of pages just of hearings and legislation just to decipher one vote. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about uh, 
bills because you made uh, an obvious but very astute point. I mean, the Bill of Rights was how many pages? Right, right. The Bill of Rights, the one that I have, fits on one page. <laughs> so, I mean, the bills today are, are stunningly enormous. I mean, thousands of pages, a lot of them are written directly by these lobbyists. And how does that fit into the special interest versus con constituent? Like, let's say I want to be engaged politically. Even back in the 70s, I would say it's impossible to follow legislation as a constituent. So you really have to trust your legislator. And your legislator can't follow all legislation. So what they're going to do is if they're going to read something back in the 70s and they don't understand it, guess how they're going to vote? Hell no. Because I've got no pressures to vote on something stupid, right? I can't read it. It makes no sense to me. No one knocked on my door and talked to me about it. I'm not going to vote for it. Now, if I hand you something that's a thousand pages back in 1970, just give me like, give me a break. I don't even have time to read it. How am I going to vote for this? But as soon as you can watch how people vote, and as soon as my pressure is, say, you're a Republican and I'm a Democrat, and I see all the Republicans voting for it, if I vote for it, I might get called out by my press anyways, right? Oh, he's siding with the Republicans. I don't even have to read it. I almost immediately, knee-jerk reaction, I have to vote against what you guys are voting. So we get this immediate partisanship. But I've also got pressures from the lobbyists to vote for it. And therefore, you could get legislation through that no one understands. And when I say no one, no one but the particular special interest. So complexity rises, page length rises. The bigger the bill is, the easier it is to insert these lines that'll make everyone fall asleep. Yeah, constituents are busy figuring out how does this affect me? What does it disadvantage my community? These thousands right, of pages, right. the special interest says, boom, this is this is Right, for insert or against this me. obscure paragraph. So again, if the citizens can't understand it, boy, that's, they stand a great chance. If people can understand it, well, it gets a little tougher. The National Rifle Association, the lobbying arm of the gun manufacturing industry, is in the spotlight for its influence in Washington in the midst of an epidemic of mass shootings. The NRA's investments to defeat gun reform, which is favored by most Americans, reached $84 million in the 2016 election alone. Right-wing Florida Senator Marco Rubio was personally confronted by survivors of the Parkland school massacre about his gifts from the NRA. So, Senator Rubio, can you tell me right now that you will not accept a single donation from the NRA in the future? No, the answer to the question is that people buy into my agenda. And I do support the Second Amendment. And I also support the right of you and everyone here to be able to go to school and be safe. And that's why I support the things that I have stood for and fought for during my time here. More NRA money, more NRA money. The influence of these groups comes not from money. The influence comes from the millions of people that agree with the agenda. Our goal here is to move forward Wait, so hold on. and, preve so, and so prevent right now, in the name, in, the name, in the name of 17 people, you cannot ask the NRA to keep their money out of your campaign? I think in the name of 17 people, I can pledge to you that I will support any law that will prevent a killer like this No, but I'm talking getting NRA money. No. But how lobbyists influence politicians is not always as clear and direct. In Marco Rubio's case, he's only received about $5,000 in direct contributions from the NRA. But they spent over $1 million on his re-election campaign. They also use different forms of intimidation against pro-gun reform politicians. James D'Angelo further explains how these lobbying strategies work. So surely it comes down to just electing the uncorruptible, right? No. <laughs> I, we don't find much evidence that they're corrupt. The way money's used, and this is all the dark money, most of the public money, and almost all of the campaign financing, is used to intimidate. Almost all of the dark money is used for advertising. And almost all the advertising is negative advertising. And so if Abby, for example, starts voting against my initiatives, we're going to start taking out negative advertising against her. Now, if you don't change your views, that actually doesn't bother us that much. It terrifies everybody else who might be voting. But if we do that, on a fairly consistent basis, and the NRA does that on a fairly, fairly consistent basis. Everybody knows that if they vote against the NRA, they're going to find tons of ads in their district, and the ads aren't going to be about guns. They're going to be on whatever would take this person out. So when Joe Manchin stepped up against the NRA, when the approval rating for tougher gun laws in the U.S. was over 90 percent, 
when he proposed some soft gun legislation, the NRA started taking out millions of dollars of ads against him. None of the ads were about guns. I mean, I, I guess I'm, it's going out on a limb to say that these people are, are not corrupted because let's say just best case scenario, everyone's joining the legislative body wanting to do good. Um, at a certain point, they know that to, to keep that position, they have to keep taking the money from their corporate donors to, because I mean, they, that's the sheer cost of running and maintaining your position in government. So where does, I mean, I don't see how the bribery isn't a thing. It's much easier for me to start funding this guy over here who's got a long history for voting for the tobacco companies and fund him and then try and take you out with a ton of negative ads and go after you on every level possible. And it's much cheaper than bribery because if I pay you for a vote today, are you gonna ask for a, more money tomorrow? Of course you will. But if I get someone who's always voted for some lunatic policy that I like and I get him in office, I'm not gonna have to pay him each time. Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, just today we have the, the sheer amount of spending on campaigns has skyrocketed so much just over the last 10 years where you have the Democratic Party actually making candidates do Rolodex tests where you have to prove that you can raise 250 grand through the right, contacts right. on your phone in order to even be backed by the party institution. Right. So I guess what I'm saying is it almost seems like self-sabotage because all of the people in their Rolodexes are obviously gonna be tied to the special interest to the corporation. So it's almost like you're shooting yourself in the foot before you even get into office. It could be. I mean, there, there, we, we certainly could expect some of that. Intimidation's baked in. But if you look at Lawrence Lessig or Zephyr Teachout who are talking about corruption, in both of their books, full books on corruption, they don't mention intimidation. It's all bribery. Humans are great at intimidation. You vote with me on this, or we talk later. That's legal, right? And everybody knows what that means. Or the NRA, after taking Deborah Maggard out in Tennessee or going after Joe Manchin, doesn't say anything. They just tell you they're watching your votes. That's all they say. That's legal, right? And if they tell you they're watching your votes, what does that mean? It means if you vote against them, you're going to have in your district you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of ads against you. Intimidation is the currency of the realm. Bribery is its orphan stepsister. Lastly, I mean, in a system where people truly did have the power, that they were able to democratize themselves and actually hold power to account, let's say not living in an oligarchy where corporations control everything, not living in this kind of inevitability of capitalism where we see uh, where we are today, wouldn't transparency work then if we actually could function as the democracy that we are all so conditioned you're to like believe? A, a liquid democracy where everybody's voting on everything. I mean, the Greeks tried that. It's pretty hazardous, right? California is very good at trying that. We do a lot of referendums here in California, right? I hear what you're saying. I just think that we've gotten to a point today where I don't think closing off transparency in the legislature is the end all be all of the solution. I think that there's a bigger system at play, which is global capitalism. And I, I, think you're, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think we're at, there, this isn't the answer to everything. This doesn't solve yeah. everything. In fact, what I'm doing in Uganda right now is because this doesn't solve everything, what am I looking at? And I actually look at, um, there's one thing, it, it's shocking that no one's measured this, but we're trying to measure this. And we're trying to measure just the median net worth of legislators. The median net worth compared to the median net worth of the citizens. And those numbers are always different, right? So the median net worth of the legislators in most developing countries is going to be a thousand times higher than the median net worth of citizens. This is not a transparency or, you know, legislative transparency issue. This is a, we're electing the elites and somehow the elites are getting into office and we're not even measuring that. And we suspect that just by measuring it, we're gonna change how we talk about democracy, right? The fact that we don't know these numbers in Canada, we don't know them in Brazil, we don't know it in Mexico, France, Sweden, Spain, none of these countries, we have these numbers. But in many of these developing countries, the difference is over a thousand, we suspect, and the legislatures are completely made up of the richest people in the country. Well, I can tell you exactly how the legislation is going to go if you get that. This isn't a transparency legislative issue. It's we're electing aristocrats.